Welcome back to another episode of Inside Number 23, my podcast which is all about knitting and sewing and generally living the craftiest life possible. My name is Katie and you can find me pretty much everywhere online as Miss Lavelli and we also have a Ravelry group for the podcast which you can find just by heading over to Ravelry, going to the groups tab and searching Inside Number 23. That's where you can get involved in things like knit-alongs, giveaways, that kind of good stuff. All of the notes and the information for the podcast episode can be found in the drop down menu um, just down below. So check that out if you have um, any questions or anything about what I talk about and you want more information about that. Also, you can contact me via email regarding anything to do with the podcast. My email is katie at inside number 23.com. So please do drop me a line if you have any questions, or queries, or you want to send prizes or anything like that. It would be lovely to hear from you. So, welcome back. It's really, really lovely to be back with you um, for another week on the podcast. It's been a little bit of a funny day here um, in the UK. Um, in case you don't know, I do podcast from the UK. I live just north of London in Hertfordshire with my husband Emrys and our gorgeous little pug Rolly. And it's been snowing on and off all day. It's been very peculiar. I thought that we were done with snow um, for this year. Um, usually by this time the, the snow kind of stops and it's not as cold but we've had snow warnings quite a lot recently so that's been a bit bizarre but it also feels a little bit strange because my podcasting schedule has gone a little bit askew again this week. I am podcasting on a Sunday. My usual podcasting day is Thursday with an upload on Friday, but for the past couple of weeks that hasn't ended up being able to happen. Um, so apologies for the slightly um, skew with schedule again this week. Fingers crossed by the time I get to podcasting next week, um, I will be back to you podcasting on my regular day for a Friday upload. However, there has been some additional content on the channel this week. I have uploaded two different videos about the Make 9 challenge that I'm taking part in this year. It's um, I believe kind of an Instagram based challenge but the idea is picking nine different projects that you want to craft during um, the year, so during 2018. I have selected nine sewing patterns and um, nine knitting patterns that I want to do during this year. So if you want to check out those videos I will pop the links in the description down below and you can go and take a look and I would obviously love to hear whether or not you're going to be taking part in Make 9 as well. Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting week here inside number 23. It's been a little bit hectic. We're in the process of booking to get our bathroom, our downstairs bathroom redone, which is incredibly exciting, but it's also been a little bit intense. A lot of work is needed to be done in order to get that all done and booked in and organized. And that's finally in process. And I am so excited because since we moved into number 23, um, we've kind of had a little bit of a hiatus when it comes to doing work on it and it is a fixer upper house 100% so it's lovely to be getting back on board with that. Also had a slight emergency yesterday when I thought our washing machine was broken but it ended up um, being something that I was able to fix yesterday by testing various things and it seems to be fully functional now but my goodness that would have been um, pretty awful if we had needed to fork out for a new washing machine so keep everything crossed that that keeps working for us you guys. <sighs> So yeah, life has been giving us a fair amount of stuff in the past week or so. A little bit of administration before we get started with the podcast this week. Thank you all so much for all of the really positive feedback from last week's episode um, when I was talking about different cows that might be planned for the year ahead. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm around another Andy sat along, um, which I do think I will be planning to do this year, but also some people requesting perhaps a knit along for a different designer. So watch this space. I'm very excited about both of those ideas and hopefully I will have some more concrete plans for you within the next couple of weeks. But yes, thank you for all of your feedback and um, yeah, I'm very excited to get some knit alongs planned for all of you lovely folks. One more thing, um, the prize winner that I drew in last week's episode for the Harry Potter knit along for December has still not got in touch with me. So um, 
If you want to head back to last week's episode and check out towards the beginning where I drew a prize, it might be you, please do get in touch. I like to um, draw my prize winners on my episodes rather than contacting people directly because I like to try and make sure that my prizes are going out to regular viewers of the podcast who are really involved in everything. Um, so I am gonna hold off on drawing another winner for a little bit, but please bear in mind that if you don't get back to me within the next couple of weeks, I will be redrawing and sending the prize out to somebody else. Um, so if it was you that won, please do get in touch with me because I really want to send you this, this lovely prize that I have. Also, for everybody who is um, putting their entrances in for the grand prize drawing for the Harry Potter Cal, you guys are amazing. I looked kind of through that thread for um, people who've made more than six different Harry Potter themed objects last year and I actually got a little bit of an emotional because it's just so amazing how many projects you created and how beautiful they all are. Um, what I would say, um, someone actually mentioned that I had said if you make 12 or more projects you're allowed to enter twice for the grand prize drawing and you absolutely can so please put two different entries in that thread if you have knit 12 or more um, finished objects Harry Potter themed last year that's absolutely fine I'm sorry that I didn't mention that in last week's episode um, but you do have until the end of January to get your entries in for that so please go ahead and just thank you all so much for getting involved in the cow um, it really is incredibly heartwarming to see how many of you obviously enjoyed it so yay big thumbs up for that Right, I think it's about time that we move on to talk about some crafty bits and pieces, don't you? Now, I'm going to kind of say straight away, I don't think this is gonna be as impressive an episode as last week's episode was. I had a lot of things that I had been working on over Christmas and New Year um, to share with you. I'd had a little bit of extra time, and um, so last week's episode was really kind of fully packed with good stuff. There is a lot of good stuff in this episode, just not as much, so I'm just kind of just putting it out there to see start off with. Um, but starting off I think I should talk about what I am wearing this week. Um, I'm actually wearing my cocoa dress. This is one of the patterns of Tilly and the Buttons um, that I made did I make this last year? Yes, I made this last year. Gosh, that feels like, I feel like I've had this for a lot longer, but it is in a Ponte de Roma fabric, so it's in a knit fabric, and I absolutely love this pattern. It is a great starter pattern for anybody who's wanting to sew with knit fabrics rather than woven, and it's just so comfortable and soft. I got this fabric whilst we were at New York last year, um, when we went for Vogue Knitting Live. I got it at Mood, which was very, very exciting. And I just love it. It's a very simple kind of um, shift dress. Um, so I'm not going to stand up to show it to you because it's, it's not that interesting. But yes, that is what I'm wearing this week. And as always, I very, very much recommend this pattern. Knitting. I've been doing a fair bit of knitting this week, you guys. Um, it's been a really interesting one because I feel like I've managed to put quite a big dent into a couple of different projects. I have two different works in progresses, works in progress <laughs> to share with you this week. Um, one of them you saw quite recently, but one of them is a bit of a languishing whip, which is very exciting that it's come back onto the podcast. But I'm going to start off with the project that I shared with you last week and I also talked about in my Make Nine video about knitting that went up just today. Um, but it is of course, in case you haven't guessed, my forest cardigan. Now this pattern is a pattern by Carrie Bostick Hodge, I believe is how you pronounce her name. I am so sorry if that is incorrectly pronounced. It's a beautiful pattern. It was originally published in um, Amarisu magazine, which I really, really love. And I have knit it up in um, Knit Picks, Wool of the Andes Tweed in the um, Autumn Heather colour, and I love it. So I have done a lot of work on this last week when I was sharing it with you. And, um, I've, I've just kind of gone from strength to strength because if you can see, I have knit 
the whole body of this cardigan now. You can see I've got my little pockets in here. Um, I had already knit up one of the sleeves when I shared this with you last time, but I have now started work on the second sleeve. So basically, I will finish knitting this sleeve, I then block the entire project, um, sew up the armholes, sew down the pockets, and once I've done that in the pattern it then instructs you to do the neck band which goes around the entire cardigan from top to bottom. I mean this thing is huge and I, I honestly do think I could have got this sleeve finished this week but it's just become such a big unwieldy project that it's it's not that easy to kind of pop into my bag and take along for commuter knitting and that type of thing now which is why it's it's gone slightly on the back burner which unfortunately does tend to happen with larger projects like this when they get towards the end because they're so just I mean it's a huge hulking thing it's ginormous and I love it I really really do and I'm super excited about finishing this but it is a beast. It's, I mean, it's incredible. But yes, still very, very much a fan of this um, project, mostly because it's almost entirely knit in garter stitch, which my high high sharps keep hitting my little bin which is just down here so if you hear a clanking noise that's what that is but um for one the garter stitch is so easy to knit because it's literally just rows and rows and rows of knitting which is incredibly satisfying but the lovely thing about it is is that i know it's going to be really warm and snuggly because obviously the garter stitch adds another kind of texture and dimension to your knitting it's get all these kind of little pockets in which air can sit which creates like a little bit more insulation so i just know that it's going to be incredibly squishy and warm and cosy when it's finished. Um, one of the most pleasing processes of um, knitting this this week was finally knitting the pockets which are both like this. So both the pockets have the little cabling detail on them which is utterly adorable. Um, and the way that you then knit the insides of the pockets is you pick up stitches um, and knit a flap which will then get sewn inside the pocket once the garment is done to create the pocket. The one thing that I would say that I'm finding a little bit difficult is when you take, um, when you put stitches on a needle, on a stitch holder for the pockets so that you could go back and pick up the stitches, you literally only leave like one stitch. Can you see that here? One stitch and then you put the rest on the needle holder and that is the only thing that is holding the rest of your knitting onto that side of of your project and i do think that that's actually had quite a detrimental effect on on the garment because this stitch is really gaping quite badly now and i'm not happy with that i wish that i had noticed sooner that it was putting so much strain on that um I think it can be resolved um, in blocking. It will definitely help. I'll be able to kind of smooth things out. And when I sew the pocket together, um, that will also help because it will give it a little bit more structure. It won't all just be hanging on by one stitch. And also when I put the neckline on, that will make a difference, but it's really not great for a really long time just to have that amount of knitting hanging off just one little stitch on the end. I, don't really like that as a design element. I am nitpicking because the rest of the pattern I think is fabulous, but that's just a little bit of irritation from me, I guess. Otherwise, I'm still really enjoying knitting on this. It's just such a fun project. And I do just want to, I want to get it off the needles now. It would be amazing to have finished the first of my Make Nine Knit projects whilst we're still in January. That would be pretty impressive. And um, I just want to wear it. I think it will be a really lovely addition to my wardrobe. And I'm very, 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 very happy with it. It's really nice that all of my projects at the minute, the second that I kind of pick them up and, and go to show them to you guys, I just want to knit on them. I think that's a pretty good place to be, to be honest. So 
I'm pretty happy about that. My other knitting work in progress is, like I said, something that hasn't had airtime on the podcast for a little bit. Um, firstly, it's living in my incredible Doctor Who um, <laughs> project bag with the Daleks and the TARDIS on it. I love this project bag. Um, this project bag was from Addicted to Sock Knitting and it was a part of a Doctor Who Valentine's Day kit that I purchased last year. Um, but in this project bag is a very exciting project that I I'm so excited about this and the funniest thing is is that it's not actually a part of my make nine challenge um this is one of the projects that I had left over from last year that I have not yet um kind of continued with and it is my and again forgive me for pronunciation I believe it's Chana or Chana sweater and this is a pattern by Lisa Newmanum. <laughs> terrible, I'm terrible but it's grown substantially since I last shared it with you. Ta-da! I love this project so much, it's making me so happy. Um, so for those of you who may be new to the podcast, which I totally didn't say at the beginning of the episode, but thank you for coming to join me again this week. It's really, really lovely to have you. And also, obviously, a big hello to any long-term viewers as well. Um, really should have said that at the top of the episode. I apologise, but obviously it's an utter joy to be spending some crafty time with you this week. But this yarn... I purchased last year at Pomfest and it is this absolutely stunning DK BFL by The Wool Kitchen and this is in their Champagne Supernova colourway which I love. This yarn when it's knit up is a lot of kind of the natural colour of the yarn but throughout the entire thing you get these little pops of neon colour and I just love it. It's gone awfully dark for a second, I'll wait for the light to readjust, that's what happens when you lift up a very um, white coloured project, but um, this yarn was originally supposed to be um, a different cardigan, the Neverton Pullover, um, which was from the anniversary uh, reprinting of Pom Pom Quarterly, the first ever edition. It is a lovely cardigan, but once I had pretty much knit the entire thing, I realised that it wasn't going to suit me, so I ripped back the entire project frog the yarn and I was pretty devastated I'm not going to lie because I bought this yarn with that project specifically in mind and I was really upset that I didn't have a really lovely project for it anymore when I saw the Chana sweater on Ravelry I just knew that it would be perfect for this yarn because it has this gorgeous texture this kind of interrupted garter stitch te texture which I love this is basically the same texture that my Kerry Town pullover has, which I wear to death and I just adore. But it also has a lot of stockinette stitch on the back. The back is entirely stockinette stitch, which really just shows off the yarn without any um, texture or anything interfering with the um, colourway of the yarn. It also has a high-low hem, which I love. So it's a little bit longer at the back. Um, which is a lovely detail that I have on um, my carry Town pullover again and also my pavement sweater that I knit last year and I really love how that style looks. So this project, to be honest, I um, started on it again this week because I made a little purchase of some more Progress Keepers from Jiggles and Beans and this is one of the newest ones that I purchased, this little kind of kawaii cloud and as soon as I saw it, I knew that it was destined to live on this project because it's just the perfect colour to be with this yarn. Uh, so I knew that that was going to happen, that I needed to pop that Progress Keeper on here. And so I picked it up, I knitted a couple of rounds, and I just remembered how beautiful this yarn is to use. The base is 100% BFL, which is one of my favourite yarn bases ever. It has a slightly, very, very slightly rustic feel to it. It doesn't have the slickness of merino, but it just has so much body and 
I know that it's going to wear really well. I can just tell that it's not going to pill a huge amount. And plus, this colorway makes me ridiculously happy. It's it's like knitting with a party yarn <laughs> because every so often you get this little sprinkling of neon colors and it's so pretty and kind of subtle but also a little bit ridiculous and over the top and I love it. And you can see just in the last couple of days how much I have done. It's, yeah, it's growing crazily. It's it's literally knitting itself at this point. Um, I have got up to the point in this sweater where um, you start from the bottom up but by the time you get to the underarm you actually need to knit the sleeves and then combine all of them to knit the yoke upwards, which is not something that I realised that you needed to do with this pattern when I first started it. So I was expecting today um, to kind of be, you know, casting off a couple of stitches for the underarm and then just whipping my way through the, the top of the sweater. But no, um, I do need to, to stop this and cast on um, another amount of um of yarn for the sleeves before i can continue with the body so this will be going to one side for a little bit which is a bit of a shame because i i've been loving working on it but the one thing that i do want to do for the sleeves that i didn't do for the body is i want to alternate skeins i was encouraged to do that when i purchased this yarn because obviously the um, Champagne Supernova knits up a certain way in a sweater, but when you knit it into sleeves, it can look completely different and it does have a lot more pooling because obviously you're going around a much smaller um, circumference than you would for a, the main body of a sweater. So by alternating skeins, you will spread out hopefully all of the little pops of color and therefore it will look more similar to the body of the sweater, the sleeves, rather than looking like the yarn is behaving in two completely different ways, which, is worthwhile knowing I think so I have three more skeins of this yarn um which I need to wind up I'm most likely going to wind up two cakes um and alternate for the sleeves and hopefully by this time next week the end will be in sight that would be so amazing because if I can get a little bit more work done on the forest cardigan and this I stand the chance to have basically two sweaters completed by the end of January which I, I'm I'm overwhelmed at that idea just myself. That's that's pretty crazy, but it would make me very very happy indeed. And yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just I mean, this is definitely going to be the year of the garment if I continue like this. I know whenever I say something like that, the week later I suddenly go, no, I'm not feeling it anymore. But these projects make me so happy. I mean, both of them texture for days seriously this oh, this is everything oh it's everything texture for days <laughs> So that's everything that I have on the needles this week. I told you it wasn't quite as much as I had to share with you last week, but I decided that for this week's episode, I'm going to reawaken um, our Dear Katie segment, which is um, the interactive segment of this podcast, where you guys can send me questions about anything and everything, and I will answer them here. If you want to get involved with Dear Katie, you just need to drop me an email to my email, which is again, katie at inside number 20. Um, with the subject Dear Katie, pop your question in it and I will get around to answering your question either on the podcast or I will drop you a reply um, via email if that's more appropriate. To everybody who has sent previous Dear Katie emails, thank you so much. I have finally got a really, really great system going with my emails, which means is that I am slowly going through and responding to the majority of people that I haven't responded to, and everything is just so much more organised. So even if your question hasn't been answered now, the possibility is that it may be answered in the new future, near future. So thank you so much to everyone who's emailed, and please do keep the emails coming because it's always lovely to hear from you. But I have two um, different questions to answer this week, um, and they are both relatively different. So let me just grab them on my phone. I uh, took little screenshots of my computer screen on my phone in order to get these questions. So first of all, I have a question sent to me by Simone. So hi, Simone. Thank you so much for your question. And that is, 
I have a quick question. I love your wedding ring set. Is there any story behind it? Um, which I thought was a really nice question because a lot of you, when you have been watching the podcast, have noticed my wedding rings on the podcast. There they are. So that is my engagement ring and my wedding ring. They're actually separate. Let me just separate them out for you. So, um, gosh, that makes my finger look like a fat sausage, doesn't it? But um, yeah, you can see they are separate. My engagement ring at the top and my wedding ring just down below. And in terms of a story, I suppose I suppose there's a, there's a kind of story to it. They're not kind of heirlooms or inherited or anything like that. The engagement ring is um, a vintage ring. It is a 1920s sapphire and diamond ring and Emrys purchased this for me himself. And he did incredibly well. Um, he picked the exact kind of ring that I would have wanted to pick for myself. Um, but one thing that I would say is that I did give him a fair bit of help because in the run up to our engagement, I think in most relationships, you often know when you're gonna be getting engaged relatively soon. And I know that I wanted to be engaged. <laughs> um, poor Amrys, I, I wasn't very subtle about telling him about the type of things that I wanted but I, I had always wanted an engagement ring with a sapphire in it mostly because sapphires are my birthstone they are also Emrys's birthstone and I personally prefer coloured stones in engagement rings to just diamonds I know that's not necessarily conventional but it's just something that I've always preferred I think they look a little bit more different and a little bit more unique so that was really lovely um, one thing that I encouraged Emrys to do uh, was to look for vintage or antique rings when he was looking for rings, just because I think that new rings are absolutely beautiful, but particularly when we were at that point in our relationship where the engagement was kind of coming up, I was pretty much full dressed vintage, either 1940s or 50s all the time. And it's something that I've always just had a real place in my heart for kind of um, something that has a bit of a history. So I love the idea that this may have been someone else's engagement ring before it was mine. It had a journey to get to me and um, Emrys bought this. I think he went to Brighton with his parents. He looked at a couple of different rings and settled on this one and it's absolutely perfect. I love it. It's it's very, very special and I like the fact that it is 100% unique. You can't just go to a shop and buy this identical ring. You could buy similar but not this exact one. Um, in terms of my wedding band, which sits just below, that kind of U shape, I um, had to get it designed. It was actually designed by a close friend of mine who is a jewellery designer and she got it made for me. Um, I specifically wanted it to be um, designed in this way so that I could still wear my engagement ring and my wedding band on the same finger because a lot of people when they have quite a large um, statement ring like my engagement ring is, they'll move it to their right hand and wear their, just their wedding band on their left hand and I wanted to be able to wear both of them. Um, so he had it specifically designed, it's to match the, um, the layout of diamonds that I have on my engagement ring. So that is similar, it's done in a kind of sympathetic style and the entire thing is in white gold, which is the same as my engagement ring. So yeah, those are my <laughs> those are my wedding rings. I hope that that was interesting, that there wasn't really a story behind them, I guess, just kind of an explanation more than a story, but thank you for your question and I hope that you liked the answer. The second question that I'm going to be answering this week was sent to me by Annette. So thank you, Annette, for your email. And um, you say to me, I am a new podcaster in Germany and I really love to podcast. Fantastic. <laughs> I got already um, plenty of positive feedback and I'm so grateful for this, but I also always get some thumbs down. What are you doing with the fact that you also get thumbs down? Does this affect you? Um, don't you want to know what's wrong or what you did wrong? Um, I'm not quite sure how to react to the fact, but there are some people who don't like my podcast. Sometimes I thought to mention it in the ne next podcast, but on the other hand, it shouldn't affect me at all, or, or what? How do you handle this? So I'd really love to know your opinion. Ah yes, the thumbs down on people's podcasts. <laughs> I personally, in my personal kind of belief system and the way that I live my life, will never put a thumbs down on a video because if I don't enjoy a video that I'm watching, 
I have the power within myself to turn off my video and go and watch something else. Um, so I've never actually put a thumbs down on somebody's video before and I don't really understand the need for people who do do that. But one thing that you may notice on pretty much every single video that I've ever posted, there will be a small percentage of people who have voted thumbs down on my videos. Um, I've noticed that it's something that happens more since I've started talking about um, a wider variety of topics, um, particularly after my 30 Before 30 series when I opened up and started talking about more varied things, I started to notice that there are some more people that give me thumbs down on videos. Um, in particular, it was getting a little bit difficult where from the second that I uploaded videos, within about an hour I would have already received four or five thumbs down on a video because it literally felt like somebody was sitting there waiting for the video to get posted so that they could then put a thumbs down on it, which is utterly ridiculous. I don't think that anybody does that. Um, I think that I'd have to be pretty paranoid to think that there was someone literally just sitting on a computer waiting for me to upload so that they could be like, on it. Um, but it does get to you, um, Annette, it does get to me, and it, I think it's completely natural that that type of thing will get to you, particularly when, like I said, it's not something that you do in your own life. When you see somebody behaving in a way that you can't really kind of comprehend or understand on in your own way, it's difficult to be able to make your peace with that because, um, you know, the internet is massive, the podcasting world is massive, even just within the knitting podcast community. If someone doesn't like what you're doing or what I'm doing, then they just have to spend less than 30 seconds searching before they can find a different podcast and see whether that gels more with their own kind of personal views and how they like to watch their knitting content. So I get that it's very, very difficult. And I am the type of person as well who will always fixate more on the, the negative feedback than the positive feedback, even though I am so lucky that I have so much positive feedback that comes back from this podcast. And I love the fact that you guys are so loving and supportive and you have been incredible in pretty much supporting me in every direction that I wanted to take the podcast in. And that has been wonderful. But, um, but yeah, I think it's just human nature to not like the fact that something that you have done, particularly with something like a podcast, which you've spent hours probably working on and editing and getting to this point where you're very happy with, um, that something that you have created like that has made somebody unhappy or has elicited a response in that person that they've wanted to show negativity to you, like literally show you their displeasure with what you've done. It's difficult. But my um, guidance on this, and I must admit, it's not always something that I find easy to do. I have spoken to some of my close friends about this type of thing, and I've literally just said, please remind me that this is what I think about this type of an issue. And that is just, when they go low, you go high try to ignore it. And I know that is so hard to do. It's really, really difficult. And sometimes you just want to say something and you just want to say, but why? I don't understand. But more importantly, I think you don't need to know why, because would you really want to keep changing the content of your podcast based on a tiny fraction of people who don't like what you're doing, as opposed to the larger percentage who do? Focus on those lovely people, focus on the people who are showing you that love, who are showing you that support, because they are the people who will stick with you. The people who give you a thumbs down every so often, they're probably not gonna stick around for very long, and fingers crossed, you know, they, they find something that they enjoy watching and that they can give a lovely thumbs up to, rather than spending their time spreading negativity. But focus on the people who are giving you the love and positive feedback, like you were saying, because those are the people that really, really matter. And when it comes down to it, you do the thing that makes you happy with your channel. If you are proud of and happy with what you have created and what you are giving out to the internet, then that's all that matters. So I think that you are gonna be absolutely fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. And I wish you the best of luck with all of your podcasting endeavors. Thank you so much, ladies, for sending me your questions this week. It was really, really lovely to hear from you. And everybody, just remember, if you'd like to ask me a question, just drop me an email and um, I will get back to you as soon as I can. I do have a little bit of sewing to share with you this week. Um, 
it's it kind of feels a little bit naughty because <laughs> I did these two big videos about my make nine challenge I know I keep kind of harping on about it and going on and on and on about the make nine challenge but it is literally just because within the last few days I have filmed and edited those videos talking about all of these projects that I'm going to be making and um, the sewing project like half of the knitting projects that I shared isn't actually on the make nine <laughs> list at all um, so it kind of feels a little bit cheeky, which I like, but um, I have almost finished another version of the Cleo dress. I just shared with you a finished version of this dress last week and I now have, um, I would say 90% finished version of, of this dress and I'm really, really happy with it. Um, I kind of said last week when I was talking about the Cleo dress, which is a pattern by Tilly and the Buttons, again, that I just find pinafore dresses really, really nice to wear. I enjoy wearing them. I wear them a lot. It's something that I can wear to work and be comfortable, but still feel kind of relatively nicely dressed. And I do have a lot of fabric in my stash specifically for Cleos. Um, when it came to making my um, list of all of the things that I wanted to do for the Make Nine Challenge, I specifically geared myself towards projects that I had not made before at all. So all of the projects included on that are patterns that I am making for the first time. And obviously I've now made two versions of Cleo. Uh, so I didn't put it on the list because um, because I've made it previously. But <laughs> I have another version of it and it's in the cutest fabric. Look at this fabric. So this is a kind of crazy um, needle, what do we call it? Uh, I'm thinking needle point, but that's definitely probably not the word. Needle cord, that's the one, needle cord um, fabric. So it's a very, very fine corduroy. And I purchased this fabric in the John Lewis sale, not this January, but the January before. So back when I purchased the cat print fabric that I used for my Blue A dress with, with all of the lovely cats on it, um, I purchased this and I always thought it would make a lovely Cleo and it does. It looks adorable. I must say that the, the needle cord does crease a little bit more than I was hoping and that's fine. You know, I've this will be the third version of this dress that I've made. So if it creases a little bit, it's not gonna be the end of the world because I already have a lot of other versions to wear. But basically, I've done almost the entire construction. So like the other two versions of Cleo that I have sewn previously, I did the front patch pocket. I also did a little bit of contrasting top stitching, which I really, really love. Um, and I haven't put any pockets on the back just because they look very cute, but I know that they're too small for me to actually really use them for anything. So maybe if I did another denim version, although I don't know why I would because I already have one denim version and one blue other version of this dress. I might put the, po the pockets on the back for aesthetics, but I didn't want to waste time putting non-usable pockets on this dress, basically. But all I have to do to finish it is to sew on the buckles, on the straps. So the straps are all done. Um, I need to put the buckles onto the front and I need to hem it. Now, the thing about my denim version, which I can't remember whether or not I mentioned this last week, was that um, it ended up being quite a bit shorter in length than I thought it would have been in comparison to the version of Cleo that I made previously. And I couldn't remember off the top of my head if I had lengthened that version or not, but there was a good few inches um, um, of difference between the finished length of my first Cleo and my second. So much so that I literally had the tiniest little hem on my denim version. It's really, really small. It's probably three quarters of an inch, um, which I usually want at least an inch, if not, you know, about two inches. And I thought, well, maybe I cut out the longer version and just kind of hemmed it a bit differently. So for this one, because I had the fabric, I ended up um, cutting the knee length version. And my goodness, 
it looks so unflattering on me in the knee length version. Um, if I wear dresses that are too far below the knee, because I'm a little bit kind of um, short in the leg department, I don't have lovely long legs, I can look like I literally just have stumpy little legs and that's what this dress looks like at the moment. It's absolutely fine because of course I will be able to hem it and all will be well, but I really don't know what went wrong in that denim version that it was so substantially shorter than the other because I obviously hadn't cut the knee length version previously but basically I need to pop the buckles onto here um, and once I've done that I can try it on properly and see the length that it will need to be for hemming um, and then once that's done I'll have another finished Clio to wear so that will already be two dresses um, sewn in January of this year so I will have already completed two dresses and almost two jumpers in just a month so I think that that's pretty impressive I just I love the Clio dress and it's something that I like I said I know that I'll wear all the time and it's so simple to sew up now because I've done it so many times I know exactly the alterations that I need to do to the pattern in terms of it fitting nicely on my waist and my hips and I actually have some other fabric that I'm hoping to be able to get cut out maybe this week possibly not but you'll recognize this fabric um because i've shown it on the podcast before but it is this one this is the um kind of brushed cotton with a little bit of stretch in it that i purchased from fabric godmother at uh the handmade fair last year and i just got a meter of this i'm thinking uh, that i will probably cut my pieces on the fold the way that the clio is put together is that you um sew your front pieces and your back pieces with a seam but with this I think just to save on fabric I'll get rid of the seam and cut them on the fold and I think that, that will look nicer as well with the with the heavily kind of patterned fabric that I have going on but I love this I think this will be beautiful I also have a black polo neck that I think would look absolutely stunning underneath this as a Clio dress so you never know, I might have another Clio dress within the next few weeks or so. I mean, that would be wonderful because then that is three different Clios that I have released from the stash this year so far. Um, and it will be it will be rivaling my Blue A dress as my most sewn pattern, which is which is saying something because I've I've sewn up an awful lot of versions of the Blue A dress by Deer and Doe, as you all know if you've been watching for a while. But yeah, my sewing mojo is way 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 up, and I'm just I'm just feeling really happy and satisfied with the amount of things that I've been able to create so far this year. It's really really good. <sighs> So guys, I told you it was going to be a slightly smaller, more streamlined version of the podcast this week. Um, I hope you don't mind too much because we had a bumper episode last week and also there's been a fair bit of additional footage this week too. So I've probably bombarded you with videos, but I hope not because I do have a couple more extra videos to share with you in the next few weeks, including um, the extra two episodes of 30 Before 30 that I hadn't edited previously. Thank you to everybody who said that they were interested in watching. So as soon as I've got those all edited together, those will be making an appearance on the channel relatively soon. So watch out for that. Thank you all so much for watching again this week. I appreciate you all so much. You are amazing. If you've enjoyed the video, please do give us a thumbs up or um, hit subscribe to be kept up to date as to when there are new videos on the channel. Um, sometimes when I say this, I think people just think that I, I just want loads and loads and loads of subscribers, which is obviously a lovely thing, um, but it just gives us more visibility on YouTube in general. The more people who engage with the channel and leave comments and like and subscribe the more people that we are recommended to and the more people get to be a part of our incredible online crafty family and that just makes me incredibly happy. So don't feel obligated. But if you could do that, that would be absolutely wonderful. I hope you all have an incredible week filled with all of the knitting and sewing and crafty goodness that your little hearts can stand. I will, fingers crossed, be back on my regular schedule by next week. I really, really hope so because being on this slightly askew schedule is really throwing me off a little bit, but keep everything crossed that we can make that happen. But for now, from me to you, I hope you all have an incredible week. I love you all and I will see you again here really, really soon. Bye!